All right, our science class. This is chapter three, rocks, materials of the solid earth. This is going to be a three-part lecture, and I'll lecture on each category of rocks. So there'll be a lecture on igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, and metamorphic rocks. This is the lecture on igneous rocks. When we talk about rocks, we have to talk about the rock cycle. This shows the relationship among the three different rock types, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. And it treats Earth as a system. There's a rock cycle. You start off typically with magma. Uh, magma slowly crystallizes and becomes an igneous rock. Igneous rocks are often found on the surface of the Earth or they're exposed at the surface through erosion and uplift. And when they're on the surface, they can weather into smaller sediments, transport, and be deposited in different environments. Okay, so we'll start there with magma. That crystallizes, cools down, and becomes an igneous rock. And as that's exposed at the surface, it'll undergo weathering, transport, and deposition. As those small pieces of igneous rocks become sediment, and they deposit in a sedimentary environment. <clears throat> and over, over time, as more and more sediment piles on top of the sediment at the bottom, uh, that sediment will lithify and become a sedimentary rock. Okay? And sedimentary rocks, if they continue to be buried deeper and deeper within the earth, the environmental conditions will change, pressure will increase, temperature will increase. And when that happens, a lot of the sediments that make up the sedimentary rocks are no longer stable and so they change. They undergo metamorphism. Okay, And when that occurs, now you have a new type of rock, a metamorphic rock. And as these metamorphic rocks are continually buried under a higher temperature and heat, they may melt and become magma again and that would complete the rock cycle. Very long rock cycle. Some of the rocks on the surface of the earth are metamorphic rocks that are 3.8 billion years old. They may have not been through the entire rock cycle. There are a number of shortcuts, though. Subigneous rocks never make it to the surface. If they remelt, then they kind of skip all these other parts and become magma again and an igneous rock. Um, some uh, sedimentary rocks can be uplifted and exposed at the Earth's surface and become sediment again and then become sedimentary rocks again through that process. Uh, some igneous rocks will metamorphose, and so they skip that whole weathering process and sedimentary process. Uh, metamorphic rocks can be exposed at the surface, and they can weather and become sediments, so they can jump to that step. And then uh, metamorphic rocks can re-metamorphose or go to higher grades of metamorphism. So there's a lot of different uh, avenues and interrelationships between all the earth processes in the rock cycle. So let's talk about igneous rocks. The parent material of igneous rocks is magma. Igneous rocks form from molten rock as it cools and solidifies. And these are some general characteristics of magma is one that the parent they're the parent material of igneous rocks and they form by partial melting in the earth's mantle. That's a typo. Okay, let's cross that out. They form in the Earth's mantle. I need to change that on the PowerPoint. And it's in the upper mantle. Uh, when magma reaches the surface, uh, it undergoes a name change. It's called lava. And lava can be emitted nonviolently or explosively. Okay, so this is uh, some daredevil you see over here is checking out a, a lava fountain over here. Okay, here's a, an, an image of Mordor. Now, this is likely Hawaii, if not Iceland. But here we have some eruption of uh, lava and lava flows on the surface of the Earth. This will slowly cool down. On the surface of the Earth, it happens very rapidly. It will cool down and become a hard uh, volcanic rock or an igneous rock. Um, click on this YouTube video when you have on your own time so you can check out um, either some lava flows or a violent eruption from a volcano. It should be exciting. Okay, so what is the nature of magma? It really consists of three components. 
a liquid portion, that's the uh, molten rock. Uh, there are solids. Those are um, uh, minerals crystallizing from the magma. All right. Typically, they're silicate minerals. Um, and they're also volatiles. Volatiles are dissolved gases. Uh, and they vaporize at surface pressure. What that means is that they escape the melt. Okay, it's kind of like depressurizing uh, a champagne bottle or uh, a soda can. When you open it, the pressure in the can and our atmosphere equalize, and then all the gases begin to come out of the liquid. Um, the most common dissolved gases in magma are just water, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. Crystallization is that process of when magma cools down, what happens is the atoms that are uh, have high entropy levels in the, in the magma begin to uh, slow down and form those chemical bonds and start to uh, uh, nucleate and start to crystallize or form the very first minerals in the magma. And so there's that systematic arrangement of ions into those orderly patterns. And the first thing, uh, one of the first things to form is that silicon oxygen tetrahedra. Okay, those little tetrahedra begin to form and they become the, the base of uh, minerals as they tend to grow. Okay, and as heat loss continues from the magma, the tetrahedra start joining together and forming those complex structures uh, that result in the, the array of different silicate minerals. Okay. The minerals that grow first or earliest have the most space to grow because the minerals kind of grow at the expense of the liquid, so they kind of use up all that material to grow. Okay, um, here are minerals growing from a solution. So uh, this is these aren't uh, igneous minerals, but this is the idea. Imagine this being magma, and then these are minerals growing at the expense of the liquid portion of the magma. And the minerals that form first typically have better crystal faces uh, than the minerals that kind of uh, grow right at the end as the liquid portion of the magma is kind of running out. So if we have magma that crystallizes at depths and never reaches the surface, we refer to that as a plutonic or an intrusive igneous rock. So it's an igneous rock you'd find underground or in the ground. Um, we, we find these rocks at the surface of the Earth following uh, long geologic time periods of uplift and erosion. Uh, <clears throat> if we have magma that makes it to the Earth's surface, it erupts as lava or, and volcanic debris, we refer to that as an extrusive igneous rock. Okay, so here's our example of an active volcano. We've got a magmatic chamber. We have some eruptions occurring. Uh, lava flows will make it to the surface. This would be the example of an extrusive igneous rock. Okay, so after the activity is kind of waned uh, in this picture here, these are extrusive igneous rocks on the surface. Ash falls, lava flows. <clears throat> in the magma chamber, the magma that um, kind of stagnated and never made it out to the surface will slowly crystallize and become an intrusive igneous rock. So these are different cooling histories. Extrusive and intrusive igneous rocks have different cooling histories. And what that leads to is differences in texture. And texture of an igneous rock describes the shape, appearance of uh, the arrangement of mineral grains that are found in an igneous rock. The theme of the next three lectures really is kind of using the observations and textures of the different rocks to tell a story or to ex extract information from. Okay, um, in igneous rocks, if we look at the texture, that reveals uh, information about the environment in which it formed. Okay, the factors that influence igneous texture are rate of cooling. If you have an igneous uh, rock that cooled very slowly, then that typically means it'll have fewer but very large minerals. If you have a fast cooling igneous rock, typically like a lava flow, those igneous rocks or extrusive igneous rocks will have a lot of very small minerals or small crystals. Another factor that affects the texture of an igneous rock is the amount of silica in them. 
if an igneous rock has a lot of silica in it, typically has a lighter appearance because it'll have a lot of light silicates and also uh, will likely stagnate in the crust because its viscosity is higher. Um, and you can look at igneous rocks and they can show evidence that they contained a lot of dissolved gases. And there's a specific name for this. We call that vesicular texture. So here are the different types of igneous textures. I'm going to include pictures with these so that you can see them. Um, when you have an igneous rock with fine grain texture, that means a lot of small minerals. The technical term is called affinitic texture. That indicates that that igneous rock cooled very rapidly. And that means it's an extrusive igneous rock. If you find an igneous rock and it has very large minerals in it, or it's coarse grained, with the technical term phaneritic, that means that igneous rock cooled very slowly deep underground for thousands of years. Right? That's an intrusive igneous rock. Occasionally, you can find igneous rocks with two crystal sizes, meaning that it has very large minerals and very small minerals. That is porphyritic texture. And what that indicates is that it had a complex history of two rates of cooling. It initially cooled very slowly, deep underground, allowing the large minerals to kind of grow at the expense of the magma. But then uh, conditions changed deep in the crust. Maybe there was another input of magma increase in pressure. And that forced that magma up towards the surface and erupt at the surface and cool down very rapidly. That would lead to porphyritic texture. Glassy texture uh, is a very fast cooling rate. Vesicular texture is one that has uh, a lot of holes in it, meaning that there, are a lot of, there was a lot of gas bubbles. This, mag this lava was volatile rich. And then pyroclastic texture is fragmented and produced by a very uh, violent eruption, and all those volcanic fragments fuse together. Okay, so here's your example of fine-grained texture. This is a basalt. This is a volcanic rock. And you, with the, you can't see the minerals uh, or identify the minerals just by looking at this rock. You'd have to use a microscope. This is affinitic texture. This basalt or volcanic rock erupted at the Earth's surface and cooled very rapidly. This is an example of coarse green texture or phaneritic texture. This is a granite. This cooled down really slowly deep within our Earth, perhaps even kilometers uh, below the Earth's surface, very slowly, thousands of years. And that allowed time for the minerals to grow very large. Okay, And you can identify some of the minerals. The pink one, you can say potassium feldspar. This is quartz. Let me find amphibole over here. So that's coarse grain texture or phaneritic texture. This is the example of two cooling rates. This is porphyritic texture. So you see here, this is a very large mineral. Okay, And then in between those large minerals, you see this mass here. We call that the matrix. Um, these are very fine grain minerals that make up the rest of this igneous rock. And so there's two grain sizes, very large ones here and very small ones in between. And so that indicates that this magma cooled down really slowly initially and then was forced upwards in a violent eruption and the rest of the liquid portion of the magma crystallized very rapidly leading to the very fine crystals. This is glassy texture. Maybe you're familiar with Game of Thrones. This is uh, what they call dragon glass, kills the White Walkers. This is super cooled lava. That's essentially what it is. It's This is lava that cooled so rapidly that minerals weren't able to form. So it's a glass, essentially. There are no minerals in obsidian. Okay, So it just looks like a shard of glass. So we call this glassy texture. And what this indicates is that this lava cooled immediately. I don't know if you've ever seen people uh, blow glass before, but what they do is they melt quartz, which is a mineral, right? Sand, quartz sand, they melt it and then they blow it into whatever shape they want, a light bulb, right? And then they just dunk that into water immediately to cool it down. And that quenches 
that uh, quartz into glass. Okay, and so essentially, these are silica-rich magmas that solidify almost instantaneously. This is vesicular texture. Maybe you've seen this before. This is pumice. Uh, it's very light. It floats in water. A lot of people like to use this uh, and uh, rub it against their elbows or the bottoms of their feet to exfoliate. Um, but there's a lot of holes and voids here. It's very frothy type rock. Um, this exhibits vesicular texture. And what that means is that this eruption contained a lot of gas. And then finally, this is pyroclastic texture. This indicates uh, that there was a violent eruption and all of these kind of angular shards of volcanic material uh, fused together with ash and some gas from that violent eruption. So and this is indicative of, of just uh, an intense eruption and all this v random volcanic material that surrounded the volcano kind of fused together to form a rock. Okay, so how are uh, igneous rocks classified? Well, essentially it's based on their texture, all those different textures we talked about, and also the minerals that are uh, present in them. And we call that composition. Remember, minerals have definite chemical composition. So based on whatever minerals are present in an igneous rock, that's going to affect its composition. Okay, so <clears throat> mineralogy is influenced by that chemical composition of the parent magma. And the texture results in the cooling history. So differing cooling history leads to different textures. So some igneous rocks will have the same composition, but they have very they look very different. Their textures are very different, and therefore they're given different names. So here's a way we classify it. Right here is mineral composition. Okay. And over on this side is texture. So let's go over mineral composition. Um, if you have uh, a lot of light silicates or silica rich or a silica rich igneous rock, we call that uh, a felsic igneous rock. Felsic is a word smash. You know, like um, when you have a spoon and a fork, you call that a spork, right? So felsic is a word smash of feldspar and silica. So those are both light silicates, and those make up the majority of light silicates in felsic rocks. And what you typically see in these types of igneous rocks of this composition, which are all of these over here, is they're generally light in color. They'll have a lot of feldspar or quartz in them. Okay, and that's what gives them that light color. The one exception is obsidian. Obsidian is silica rich. But the only reason it's black is because it's super cooled, so minerals weren't allowed to crystallize. And so uh, the metallic ions that are in them are what color it black. But if you notice, granites are generally kind of lightish or pinkish in color. Rhyolites are light or pink. Okay, So that's the felsic end of the compositional spectrum. The other end of the spectrum uh, is mafic. Okay, Mafic is, again, another word smash, M-A-F-I-C. That means that this has a lot of magnesium, and the thick part is uh, ferrous or iron. So magnesium and iron put together is mafic. Now igneous rocks with mafic composition, so these guys over here, are made up of dark silicates. Dark silicates like pyroxenes, olivines, some garnet. Um, so these are generally uh, minerals that have more iron and magnesium in them. So it makes it, it kind of, uh, in terms of color, uh, kind of darkens the the uh, the color of these igneous rocks, um, and it also makes them much heavier because they have more iron and magnesium in them, and you find more dark silicates found in these rocks. Okay, and then in between mafic and felsic, we have a composition called intermediate. So it's uh, a mix of both felsic and mafic minerals together. And generally, uh, intermediate composition are these kind of grayer type rocks because they're kind of like 50-50 mixes of them both. So that's the, the classification based on mineral composition. There is ultramafic composition. These are rocks we'd find in the mantle. And so they have a lot of pyroxene and olivine in them. They're very dark, even almost greenish. Um, and so the, those are ultramafic igneous rocks. Okay, and then the other division 
is its texture. Okay, so over here, these are all the rocks with phaneritic texture, meaning that they have coarse grains in them, or they're coarse grained, very large minerals. That indicates that they're intrusive igneous rocks. They cool down for thousands of years deep within the crust, very slowly. Aphanitic here, these igneous rocks cool down very rapidly, okay? Um, but you can see there are different compositions, felsic, intermediate, and mafic, basalt, andesite, rhyolite. Here are the porphyritic rocks, all right? Two cooling histories, glassy texture, vesicular texture for these two, and then pyroclastic texture, okay? So that's it. That's how we classify igneous rocks, based on mineral composition and also their texture. So rock, igneous rocks with different mineral composition can exhibit the exact same texture. All right, so let's talk about some of these igneous rocks. Most common igneous rock, uh, well, is basalt, but on the continental crust is granite. Granite is a felsic igneous rock, meaning that it, so it has a lot of feldspar and silica. It's rich in silica. It's coarse grained or phaneritic, okay? Um, it's one of the most abundant igneous rocks. It's often used as countertops in kitchens, okay? It has 10 to 20% quartz, around 50% potassium feldspar, and less than 10% dark silicates, okay? Um, and I'll show you a picture in the next slide. Rhyolites are compositionally similar to granites. They're felsic, okay? But they look very different. And the reason is because their cooling history is different. These are extrusive or volcanic igneous rocks. So they're fine-grained or aphanitic. So their minerals are very small and you can barely even see them. Okay, they're very light colored. Sometimes they can come in gray and they're less common than granite. So here's granite. This is at Yosemite National Park. This is El Capitan, Two, over 2,000 feet sheer uh, rock face. Uh, people will climb this. Crazy people will do it without a rope. All right, but that's granite. This is it right here. This cold, deep underground is an intrusive igneous rock. Rhyolite is compositionally the same, but looks totally different. Oh, I don't have a picture? Okay, trust me, it's a pink rock. <laughs> um, it, it's a pink rock where you can't even see the minerals. Um, maybe you can Google it. All right, whatever, big fail. Okay, let's go on with more different felsic igneous rocks. Obsidian, I showed you this before. That's that dragon glass, dark cl colored glassy rock. This forms when you, when you have silica rich lavas cool quickly at the earth's surface. Okay. Pumice is also a felsic igneous rock, but this one is, has vesicular texture. Okay, those voids are noticeable. Okay, uh, sometimes they have fine shards of glass in them. And you find them a lot of times deposited with uh, obsidian. Um, and they will float in water. So there you go. That's not obsidian. That's pumice. Another typo. Excuse me. That's pumice. All right. And this is obsidian. Oh, I see what happened. All right. So it's just one slide, two different pictures. But this is obsidian. Okay, so let's move on to intermediate uh, composition uh, igneous rocks. Andesite is a very common intermediate igneous rock. It's volcanic in origin. You often find it in the Andes. Mm -hmm. um, and it commonly uh, exhibits porphyritic texture and has kind of a gray appearance. It's fine grain because it's volcanic in origin. So it's aphanitic. Diorite is the uh, compositional equivalent to andesite, but it's an intrusive igneous rock. Okay, so it's coarse grained or phaneritic. Um, it looks like granite, but it lacks visible quartz crystals. It can also have a salt and pepper appearance. Yay, I got images. So this here, let me erase these red lines. Sorry. This here is andesite. Okay. It's gray, very fine grain. This one almost looks porphyritic. And then here's your diorite, the salt and pepper type appearance. But you can see it's intermediate in composition, half dark silicates, half light silicates. Okay, basalt. This is the most common uh, volcanic rock on Earth. It's mafic in composition. It's very dark green to black, 
fine grain or aphanitic. It's mostly made up of pyroxene or plagioclase feldspar. You can occasionally find olivine phenocris in them. Um, and it makes up the upper layers of the ocean crust. The Hawaiian Islands, Iceland, are completely composed of basalt. Here you go. And here's a volcanic vent erupting basaltic lava, which will eventually become this right here. So this is your aphanitic basalt right here, very fine grain, volcanic in origin, crystallizing at the surface of the earth. Here's your porphyritic basalts. You can see large minerals growing in a fine matrix, okay? And then this is scoria. This is just vesicular basalt. So this contained a lot of gas bubbles. Okay, the compositional equivalent to basalt, it, but just an, uh, uh, cooled down really slowly deep underground, uh, is referred to as gabbro. Okay, so gabbro is coarse grained. You can see that here. Um, so it's phaneritic and it's typically very dark green to black. It has a lot of pyroxene and plagioclase feldspar. And it, you don't really find it on the continental crust, but you do find it uh, within the ocean crust. Okay, so where does magma come from? Uh, its origin is in the upper mantle. Okay. Um, the greatest amounts of magma are produced at divergent plate boundaries. We'll, we'll talk about those, plate bo those boundaries uh, when you watch the lecture on plate tectonics. Um, another uh, environment where magmas are generated are at subduction zones. Uh, you can see one in the GIF there. Here we have a subducting plate. And as it goes down, it lowers the melting temperature of the asthenospheric mantle, and that generates melts, and they rise up and erupt at the Earth's surface. Um, and then finally, uh, one way melts can be generated are when crustal rocks collide with each other, uh, and, and uh, the heat has risen, and then you get crustal melts as a result of that. Okay, so um, the geothermal gradient is a measurement of how hot the earth gets the deeper and deeper you go. And typically, um, that rate of increase is about 25 degrees per kilometer. So as you go deeper and deeper within the earth, every kilometer you go, it gets 25 degrees warmer, 25 degrees Celsius warmer. So what happens is rocks in the lower crust and the upper mantle around that boundary are very close to their melting points. However, they don't really get to their melting points. We know this because um, there are experimental petrologists that use rocks that are likely found in the lower crust and also in the mantle, and they subject them to higher temperatures and pressures to find out when they melt. And what they realize is under normal conditions with the geothermal gradient, these rocks are very close to their melting temperatures, but they don't actually melt. So there has to be processes that trigger melting. And this is where plate tectonics comes in. These geologic processes uh, reduce the melting point of the mantle by uh, either three ways. One is decreasing its pressure, adding a foreign substance like water, or increasing the temperature drastically. Okay, so this is what experimentalists determined. Look at this graph. This shows you depth in kilometers. So here's the surface of the Earth here. And then we go deeper and deeper within the Earth all the way down to about 500 kilometers. Okay. Depth is, you know, synonymous with pressure. Okay. The deeper and deeper you go, the more pressure the rocks will be under at a higher depth. Okay. So on this, this is the same axis. The y-axis here is pressure in kilobars. And then on the x-axis is temperature. So here's zero degrees Celsius all the way to 2,500 degrees Celsius. Hot, okay? So they determined, these experimentalists determined the geothermal gradient, right? 25 degrees per kilometer. That's a geothermal gradient. And then uh, this is the melting curve for peridotite, okay? So the, this is experimentally determined. They essentially um, subjected this rock peridotite to temperatures, uh, all different types of temperatures, and find out whether or not it would melt at different pressures. And so this red line here is the melting curve. 
And what you notice is that the geothermal gradient never actually reaches the red line here. And so under normal conditions, the lower crust, which is typically on average close to about 100 kilometers, it's very close to its melting temperature, but doesn't actually get there. Okay. And so the three ways in which melt is generated is because of tectonic processes. The first one is decompression melting. And what happens here is you have um, a stenospheric mantle that is uh, at this temperature, right, at, at very deep depths, let's say here, 150 kilometers, and it's forced upwards. And that is what depressurization means, right? You're decreasing pressure, so you move upwards. So mantle, asthenospheric mantle rocks at this temperature will move straight up this diagram, and then it'll intersect this red line. And then what happens is partial melting begins. And what causes that decompression is the spreading of tectonic plates. And I'll show you that in a second. In subduction zones, what happens is um, when you have a subducting ocean plate, that introduces a lot of water to the sphenospheric mantle around 100 kilometers. And that changes the shape of this curve. And so the curve uh, moves downward with the presence of water and then melts are generated here. Okay, let's let's just go to the examples here. Okay, this is decompression melting. So what happens is if you reduce the confining pressure on the stenospheric mantle, that mantle will start to rise up and then start to melt. So um, when they ascend to lower pressure, it induces melting. And this occurs at divergent plate boundaries. And it also occurs when there are mantle plumes. Mantle plumes are really hot portions of the mantle and diapirs form and they kind of rise up like that and they move kind of upwards and then they start decompressing and melting as they move. Okay, so here you go. Here's a divergent plate boundary. Okay, so we have one plate moving in that direction, one plate moving in this direction. And as they do, uh, kind of creates a gap here in between them. And so here the asthenospheric mantle rises to fill that gap. Okay. And as it rises, it's really hot, right? It's This is over 200 kilometers of, of depth. This material is rising, and it's rising, and, and the pressure is lowering because it's rising closer to the surface, and then it begins to melt. And then those melts are generated, and they kind of uh, move into this area, move into a magmatic chamber, and some of those melts, uh, they most of them actually crystallize and become part of the uh, ocean crust on either plate, but some of them do erupt and erupt in this rift valley at the bottom of the ocean floor. And so here's that, here's a lithospheric plate going in this direction, one end going that direction. We call that a divergent plate boundary. And mid-ocean ridges will form as a result of that. Very volcan uh, volcanic regions at the bottom of the ocean. And this is where you have upwelling mantle rocks, which induces a lot of melting. The other example is at a subduction zones where you have addition of water. Um, so this is uh, very similar to um, in the wintertime, if you've ever been to places where they, they throw salt on the sidewalks and streets. Um, the reason why they do that is because that uh, raises the freezing temperature of, of uh, water, so ice does not form. And so essentially what you're doing is you're adding an impurity to water, and now it will no longer freeze at uh, zero degrees Celsius. Now it will only freeze at a much lower temperature. So in a subduction zone, what happens here, it's a convergent plate boundary and ocean plates will sink into the mantle. And as they do, the heat and pressure will drive the water that exists in the ocean crust. And that water will be driven out and expelled into the overlying mantle wedge. And those fluids migrate into that mantle wedge and they induce weathering because it lowers the melting temperature of the metal. Okay, so here's that subducting ocean plate. So this plate is moving in this direction, right? And then it crashes into this plate that's moving in this direction. This plate is more dense. That's why it sinks and it subducts, okay? And as it subducts, it kind of descends into the mantle. This is the mantle here, and this is the stenospheric mantle. And so as the ocean plate descends, 
Um, this is where the volatiles are driven off the surface of the downgoing plate, and then that lowers the mantle melting temperature, and now it's hot enough to create melts, and then those melts are generated. They rise buoyantly through the overlying lithosphere. The majority of them uh, crystallize deep underground as intrusive igneous rocks, uh, but some of them do actually make it to the surface, and this is why we have volcanoes located in certain regions on Earth. So melts are generated in this fashion as well. And then the last case is when you have an increase in temperature. Um, and that's induced by two uh, continental crustal lithospheric plates slamming into one another. Um, when this occurs, you'll have uh, melts pond beneath the less dense crust. Uh, but this is a, a very uh, small amount of melts that are, are produced in this fashion. Okay, so most magma that's generated in these environments, they emplace themselves at depth in the earth. They never make it to the surface. The majority of them never make it. And so they slowly crystallize and become intrusive igneous rocks. And we call these intrusive igneous bodies or plutons. Okay, and we classify plutons based on their shape. Um, if they're table-like, um, we call them tabular. Um, if they're kind of blob shape, then we call them massive. Okay, and there's two uh, table-like um, types of plutons. There are discordant and concordant ones. Discordant ones, they cut across existing rocks that are in the crust, and concordant ones run parallel to existing rocks in the crust. Let me show you pictures. Okay, so here's an example of an active volcanic area. Uh, here are rising melts, and they're becoming uh, magma chambers. A lot of them have already kind of solidified to become intrusive igneous rocks. But here you can see, you see these here? Um, these are discordant injections of magma that move through the crust. Okay, those are uh, igneous bodies. We call these dikes. Okay, um, whenever magma kind of takes advantage of this lateral movement, then we call those sills. Okay, here, so here's the vol volcano eruptions. We can have fissure eruptions and extrusive uh, lava flows hit the surface. Okay, but as activity kind of wanes away, uh, these areas. Uh, the magma will all solidify and become intrusive igneous rocks. And then over time, uh, the area will uh, uplift and erode and expose kind of the roots of these volcanoes. Um, and so it'll expose some of the uh, dikes that you see here. This is a radial dike. This is what it looks like. And then over time, uh, as you get more and more erosion, these intrusive igneous rocks will be exposed on the Earth's surface. And these can be as, as mountains like we see it. Yosemite National Park. Okay, we call these batholiths. All right, so here's a dike. This is an example of a dike. So here are existing rocks in the crust that were deposited kind of horizontally, and a dike just barges through, and it's just an injection of uh, magma kind of moving upwards within the crust. And then it solidifies, and then you just have a crazy shaped igneous rock just cutting through everything. Okay, it helps transport magma upwards. And if we have a lot of them, we call it a dike swarm. All right, uh, a sill is where you have a concordant pluton. Okay, here it's it's nearly horizontal. So here you can see it. This is an igneous sill. See how it's nearly horizontal? Okay, this takes advantage of the weaknesses, horizontal weaknesses in the existing country rock and then kind of moves through them. Uh, a lot of them can exhibit uh, what we call um, uh, columnar jointing. Okay, I think I have a picture. These are like pillar-like columns. Okay, here's another sill as an example. This is horizontal sill. Uh, it almost looks like a, uh, uh, like a de horizontally deposited sedimentary rock, but if you look closer, look at its texture, you'll find out that it's an extrusive igneous rock, and you're like, oh, this is a sill. Uh, the, one of the most famous sills is in New York, the Palisade sill. If you go over the B Brooklyn Bridge, you see that dark cliff rock exposed there, um, that's also a sill. Okay, so here's a dike that's radiating uh, away from uh, a volcano. 
Okay, and a lot of times after the activity is over, this area kind of erodes away and exposes uh, the the dikes that help transport magma upwards towards the surface. Okay, here's the columnar joining that I mentioned before. So what happens is these are injections of magma through the crust, and as they make it closer to, closer to the surface, they cool down and contract, and then they kind of uh, create these um, uh, hexa he hexagonal uh, shapes or columns. Giant's Causeway is a, a cool example of this on the surface. You can kind of jump around on these pillars. Okay, and if you see um, or uh, if you have um, a blob-shaped giant intrusive body, we call that a batholith. Those are the largest intrusive bodies. Um, a lot of times they occur as kind of linear structures that are hundreds of kilometers long. Um, so if you have surface exposure of 100 plus square kilometers, we call that a batholith. But if it's smaller than that, then we call it a stalk. And while they're very expansive and they can cover, cover huge swaths of the landscape on Earth, uh, they're very thin, okay? So they're typically less than 10 kilometers thick. And they're composed of uh, mostly felsic and intermediate igneous rocks, okay? So many wonder, like, how do these batholiths emplace themselves in the crust? So what happens is it has to do with uh, density, okay? Magma at depth within the crust, um, is it's less dense than the surrounding rock. It's kind of like if you're in your pool and you have a boogie board, ever try to, like, push the boogie board underwater, right? That thing's always going to pop up and smack you in the face, okay? That's because the boogie board is less dense than the water, okay? So in the mantle... Uh, the more buoyant magma pushes aside the rocks surrounding it, and this process we call shouldering. That's like a, a lot like if you're at a concert and you're trying to get to the front of the concert, you kind of shoulder your way through people. I guess the same idea. Okay, and a lot of times as this magma kind of encounters uh, cool and brittle rock, it'll break it apart, apart and dislodge that material and then it becomes entrained inside the magma. Sometimes it can completely melt that stuff, but other times um, uh, uh, it kind of preserves and cools down with the magma. And we call that, um, uh, we call those xenoliths, those blocks of country rock we call xenoliths. And that's how we have samples of the mantle. Um, volcanic eruptions, especially ones like say in Hawaii where they're from deep mantle plumes, um, those eruptions can be, uh, the, the, the magma that's generated is generated really deep and it can rip up portions of the mantle and then bring that to the surface. Okay, that process is called stopping. Okay, and so here, this is, um, the areas in red are areas that are covered uh, by these intrusive igneous rocks or batholiths. This is the Sierra Nevada batholith. That's this majestic picture of the valley here in Yosemite. Okay, there's the half dome in the background. Absolutely beautiful area. It's a playground of intrusive igneous rocks sculpted by glaciers, okay, in the past. Waterfalls, absolutely stunning. That's here in this kind of uh, eastern part of California. But the batholith extends into Mexico. Okay, we have the Idaho batholith. And then we have this coastal range batholith that goes all the way through to Alaska. So there are large portions of the North American continent that are covered by igneous rocks. And then there are other areas. Here is Torres del Paine in Chile, southern Chile, an absolutely beautiful area where you also find um, intrusive igneous rocks exposed at the surface. Absolutely amazing.